Our speaker this morning, a, a really, really real privilege to uh, introduce our speaker this morning, is Joe Hobbis. Um, Joe is part of the team, uh, part of the crew, serves here in the life of the church. I'm sure she'll introduce herself um, even more, but I've loved getting to know Joe and her family, uh, have been part of the church now for some time. Uh, such energy, such uh, excitement, and always a wonderful time having a conversation with them and hearing their heart for, for all things here as well. So, would you please welcome Jo as she comes to speak to us this morning. Make sure it's switched on. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Jo. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think I'm generally known around Bay Church as Milo's mum. Um, but before I begin, you should also know that I am mum to Louis, who is with us this morning. Thank you, darling. <laughs> and I am married to a man with a magnificent moustache. <laughs> that is Jamie. We always sit in the um, third row from the front on the left-hand side of the church. I don't know why, but it happens, doesn't it? And then we all end up sitting next to the same people every week. So to those of you on the right-hand side of the church, you've never seen me before... Hello, it's really nice to meet you. Now, how many of you have heard it said that when we ask for something, the Lord will give us one of three answers? Yes, no, or wait. And which is the hardest response to accept? For me, it's wait. Waiting is hard, right? Not knowing when something will happen, but holding on to the hope that it will, it can feel like we're sitting in the dark, fumbling around, trying to make sense of the surroundings, not knowing what the path ahead looks like. Excuse me while I take a sip. I've got a great job. I work for a Christian media company creating content for kids so that they can learn about Jesus. It's something I'm passionate about. It combines all my favorite things, and I love it. I believe God put me there. But the last year has been a season of waiting. As a business, we've experienced a significant, significant financial struggles, and we've been operating on a month-by-month -month basis, not knowing if we'll have enough money to cover our outgoings. It feels like we're sitting in the dark. But then... I started to think, what if this darkness isn't really darkness at all? What if it's the shadow of the Lord? What does it mean to wait in the dark with the Lord? And what can we learn while we're there? Come with me and let's discover that when we're in God's shadow, one, we are not alone. Two, we are safe. And three, we can rest. Psalm 91 says, Whoever rests in the shadow of the Most High God will be kept safe by the Mighty One. He will cover you with his wings. Under the feathers of his wings, you will find safety. It's a beautiful image, isn't it? But as I imagine any penguin chick would testify... It's not the most bright and airy place. In fact, it might be downright uncomfortable. When our son Louis was very tiny, but his energy levels were enormous, Jamie found an ingenious way to occupy and entertain him while putting in minimal effort himself. When Louis announced one sunny day in the garden that he was bored, Daddy told him, to try and run away from his shadow. Genius, right? Kept him busy for at least 10 minutes, which was quite long by Louis' standards. When you're sitting in the shadow of the Lord, you're sitting as close to him as you can get. His shadow is part of him. And just like Louis in the garden, he can't be detached from it. So, if the darkness we find ourselves in is God's shadow, we know that we are not alone. In John 14, 16 to 17, Jesus says, 
I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. So last month, my job sent me to Big Church Festival. It's a massive Christian music festival that happens every year in the grounds of a country estate in West Sussex. I've never been to a music festival before. I've never felt inclined to go to a music festival before. But here I was, rucksack on my back, ready to spend a weekend all by myself amongst thousands of other people. There I am, ready to go. Rucksack's nearly as big as me. I was working with others, but I was the only one staying on site. So each night, I was left alone to eat, to wander the site, and to cozy up in my very tiny tent. There it is. It's quite small. It's all I could carry. Sounds lonely, doesn't it? A little bit daunting, maybe? But I had the most profound feeling throughout the whole weekend that I was not alone. I felt completely at peace. I didn't crave the interaction of others because the presence of Jesus by my side was so tangible and it was amazing. Waiting is hard. But when we choose to follow Jesus, he promises to give us the Holy Spirit to live in us. So we're never alone. Sitting alone in the dark is a lonely, even frightening place. But sitting in the dark with someone you love feels entirely different, doesn't it? And God loves us more than we can comprehend. So just take a moment to imagine sitting in the dark with someone you love. How does it feel now? Exciting? Adventurous? Certainly intimate. Waiting deepens our relationship with God. We are not alone. There's a line in a song by the Arctic Monkeys, which I won't sing for you, but it says, you and me both know that the nights were mainly made for saying things that we can't say tomorrow day. There's something about sitting in the dark with someone that makes us more open and honest. Remember the chats you had at your teenage sleepovers? Sitting in the dark makes us more inclined to share secrets and to listen. Without visual distraction, we can hear more clearly. Have you ever noticed how much louder things are in the dark? The ticking clock, the creaking pipework. Our lack of vision heightens our sense of hearing. In Luke 5, 16, we read, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Even Jesus needed to spend time alone with his father, presumably to listen. Teacher and writer John Mark Comer says, Jesus' life template was based on a rhythm of retreat and return. If we want to reach the depth of life with God that Jesus modeled, we need to find a diversion-free place to get and be alone with the Father. Waiting is confusing. But confusion doesn't come from God. If you feel like you're waiting in the dark, perhaps there's something the Lord really wants you to hear. Take the time to stop and listen. In his book, How to Hear God, here it is, Pete Gregg says, learning to hear God's voice, his word and his whisper, is the single most important thing you will ever do. This is a brilliant book. Pete talks about all the different ways God speaks to us. He gives examples of people hearing from God and acting on it, and he offers practical exercises to try yourself. It's helped me to learn to read the Bible expectantly, knowing that God will speak to me through it. It's taught me about how God speaks through nature. So now I often go on a prayer walk. I'll take myself somewhere beautiful, and we've got plenty of choice around here, haven't we? And I just ask God to point some stuff out as I walk. And then I think about the things I notice, and I wonder about what God might be saying to me through those things. So recently on the banks of the River Dart, I saw a really big tree grow, looking like it was growing out of a rock. 
And it reminded me that we are strong and growing when we keep ourselves rooted in Jesus, our rock. And so I thanked God for that and I prayed about it. And do you see how it works? It becomes a conversation. Now, clearly, where I work, we're all Jesus-y people doing a Jesus-y job. So the fact that everything hasn't gone exactly to plan is really confusing. Surely God would want to bless us for all this wonderful work we're doing in his name. So we have prayed, we have fasted, we have sought prayer from others, which is why I'm always up at the front getting prayer. And of course, we've read the Bible together. And all we've heard from God has been constant encouragement. Keep going. Joy is coming. It will get better. And all the time, our immediate needs have been met at the end of each month. Just like God gave the Israelites manna in the desert. So, we keep waiting. But we're still in the dark. Whoever rests in the shadow of the Most High God will be kept safe by the Mighty One. We are not alone, and we are safe. Let's have another look at that penguin. He might not be comfortable, but he is safe, isn't he? My husband's testimony is quite a dramatic one, which is his to share, not mine. But suffice to say, he found himself in a dangerous situation in the woods, in the pitch dark. At first, the darkness terrified him. It was disorienting. He couldn't find his way out. Then he realized it could also work in his favor. Whilst he couldn't see, he also couldn't be seen. He describes a moment when he realized the darkness was his friend. I think God keeps us in the waiting for our own safety. If we lean into it, instead of pushing against it, we lean into his protection until he knows we're ready for what comes next. Author and speaker Christine Kane posted this on Insta recently. When God places a dream, idea, or purpose in our hearts, it then takes time, planning, and patience to get there. We have to grow where God wants us to go. If we submit to his process and walk at his pace, we'll get where we need to go in his perfect timing. There is grace and pace for your race. You don't need to rush, only to seek God above everything else. But just because it's safe doesn't mean it isn't painful. Waiting is painful. My work journey hasn't been without loss. In January, my closest friend, my work bestie, lost her job. It really hurt, like actual heartbreak. I know I still get to be her friend, but it's not the same as working together every day, and she lives in Canada, so it's not like it's easy for us to meet up. I grieved, and so did she. But I'm reminded of the story of Lazarus in John 11, 1 to 44. You can look it up if you want to. I'm just going to summarize. Jesus was told that his friend Lazarus was gravely ill and he was asked to go to him. But then he left it four days before he got there. And quite fairly, I think, Lazarus's grieving sisters say, Lord, I wish you'd been here, then my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus knew the ending. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But in verse 33, we read, Jesus saw her crying. His spirit became very sad and he was troubled. And then in verse 35, Jesus wept. Waiting is painful. But Jesus meets us in our pain. He feels it with us, even when he already knows the outcome. And because we're in a safe place, it gives us opportunity to process that pain. Sit with Jesus and cry. Tell him how you feel. Be honest. It's okay to be angry, sad, disappointed, even desperate. I found that it's in these moments of raw emotion that he draws even closer, pulling us into the safety of his wings. And I can honestly say that in this painful season of waiting, I have felt closer to God 
than at any other time in the last 30 years. According to experts, it's really normal after periods of stress to feel super tired. It's all to do with our hormones. So much is, isn't it? During stress, cortisol is released to help keep us alert and prepared for action. But, and this is the important bit, once we feel safe again, our bodies initiate a process called nervous system regulation, allowing the system which makes us to feel tired to take over. And it's like hitting the reset button. No surprise then that as we lean into the safety of God's shadow, we find it's a place we can rest. Do you ever feel like you just need to lie down in a darkened room to catch your breath before the next thing happens? What a delight it is to find rest and peace in the dark. God knows that. In Genesis 2, we read, on the seventh day, he rested from his work. Friends, even God rested. Not because he was exhausted, but because he wanted to enjoy what he had made. What if we see the time of waiting as a time to reflect on the good things that have gone before and to give him praise? The world tells us that waiting is all about anticipating what comes next. Like we're in a queue trying to get to the front. You know when you order in McDonald's, I'm looking at Pete, <laughs> and you see your ticket number come up on the screen under the heading preparing. And as you're waiting, it gradually moves up the screen, doesn't it? And you'll keep, you keep watching, you're willing it over to the ready to collect column. And it's like a race, isn't it? And you're thinking, well, what if that order in behind me jumps in front? Maybe I could jump in front of that order in front of me because they're ordering three milkshakes and four Big Macs and they're taking out the gherkins. And dissatisfaction. When we only look forward, when we totally focus on the thing we're trying to reach, it becomes a burden. But that's not God's way. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Waiting is frustrating. But it becomes easier to bear when we can begin to see it as a time of rest. And I've learned to focus less on what I don't have yet, and more on the good things that God has done for me to bring me this far. To help me do that, I keep a prayer journal. I use it to write down things I've heard from God, Bible verses, words people have had for me, things I've seen on my walks. It's so encouraging to look back over it and see his purposes working out. God is faithful. He loves you. You are his masterpiece. And he says in Jeremiah 29, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Waiting is frustrating. But God can be trusted. Going back to the Lazarus story, we see that for their part, Mary and Martha trusted Jesus, even in their pain and confusion. They took him to the tomb. They followed Jesus' instruction to move the stone, even though it seemed like a really bad idea, by the way. And they got to see the miracle. Jesus raised their brother from the dead. Psalm 46.10 tells us to be still and know that I am God. If we're sitting in the dark, sitting in the shadow of the Lord, we have to be still because it's hard to move around freely. And then when he does call us forward and we're still in his shadow, what can we do but grab hold of his hand and let him lead us? Psalm 121 promises that he won't let us stumble, but it requires us to trust that he knows the way. Waiting is hard, but God never changes. And I have learned that the adventure begins when we give God our yes, whether we can see the way ahead or not. Trusting him in his timing is the beginning of growth. Let me finish by telling you about the Chinese bamboo tree, because this plant is crazy. The gardener plants the seed, and he'll see nothing but a single shoot coming out of the bulb for a full five years. 
But that tiny shoot must have daily food and water. And during all the time the gardener is caring for the plant, food and water every day, the exterior shoot will grow less than an inch. Then, at the end of five years, the Chinese bamboo performs an incredible feat. It grows an amazing 90 feet tall in only 90 days. I know, right? So, when did the tree actually grow? During the first five years or during those last 90 days? The answer lies in the unseen part of the tree, the underground root system. During the first five years, the root structure spreads deep and wide in the earth, preparing to support the incredible heights the tree will eventually reach. Waiting is hard. But what if the darkness you're waiting in is actually the shadow of the Lord? What if this is your preparation time where you can rest in the safety of his shadow and deepen your relationship with him so he can make you ready for the good things he has in store for you? Seeds must germinate in the darkness of the soil before they can grow into beautiful, fruit-bearing trees. Amen. Amen.